Welcome. This is the Free Market Roadshow, probably the largest annual series of public conferences on economics. Remarkable experts are discussing the challenges and providing libertarian solutions to today's problems. Organized by the Austrian Economic Center in cooperation with select th institutes, universities and think tanks, the Free Market Roadshow tours all over Europe. Today we pay a visit to Warsaw. Civil Development Forum is a non-governmental think tank based in Poland promoting and defending economic freedom, the rule of law, individual liberties, private property, entrepreneurial activities and ideas of limited government. Forum aims to achieve its goals through fact-based reports and analysis, efficient communication and civil society mobilization. Our think tank was founded in 2007 by Leszek Balcerowicz, who served as Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance during successful economic transition in 1989. In 2013, we organized our first free market roadshow in Warsaw. Civil Development Forum's work in Poland is visible in the fields of ideas and policy making, and our experts are regular guests in the media. We also cooperate with many freedom-oriented organizations in Poland, Europe and the rest of the world. While initial successes of Poland were based on free market reforms, we need to do more to close the gap between Poland and Western Europe that was created due to socialism. Civil Development Forum has been active during the current pandemic in analyzing policy responses and providing recommendations for the future recovery which should be based on liberalization of the economy and strengthening of the rule of law. Good afternoon, good morning or good evening as you can watch us in different time zones. Uh, welcome to the next uh, free market roadshow in Warsaw in Poland organized by the Civil Development Forum. Today, uh, you are more than welcome to ask questions uh, so we can try to answer them in the end of our panel. Uh, and you can do this on YouTube or Facebook, wherever you are watching us. Uh, today, we are going to talk about the post-pandemic recovery and how to unleash economic potential through strengthening free market reforms and uh, uh, how to make sure that prosperity is uh, coming back after the crisis. Uh, we are, have three guests today and they all represent think tanks from Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, today with us we have Adrian Nikolov, economist uh, from uh, Bulgaria from Institute for Market Economics, Martin Panek from Czech Republic who is director at Liberalny Institute and Martin Vlachinsky, analyst at in Institute of Economic and Social Studies in Slovakia. Uh, so you can see uh, that we'll hear today uh, people from countries from Central and Eastern Europe, which not only have to think about the post-pandemic recovery, uh, but also think how to close the gap that still exists between our countries and wealthier economies of Western and Northern Europe. Uh, our guests represent think tanks, so I'm sure they are also have their own visions of uh, and policy recommendations uh, about what should be done in their respective countries to reform economies and make sure that recovery uh, is rapid after COVID-19. So I would like to start with the uh, first introductory question and ask our guests to give us a bit of uh, a background about what is currently discussed by their ruling politicians, uh, uh, policymakers about solutions for post-COVID uh, recovery. In Poland, the government is speaking about so-called Poland's New Deal, which name is inspired by uh, uh, Roosevelt's New Deal, and I don't think it's a great recommendation for uh, policy making. And uh, it seems that more state intervention is expected and higher taxes to pay for debts that were um, taken during the pandemic. So I would like to hear more about the situation in Bulgaria, Czech Republic and Slovakia, what your politicians are thinking, are thinking that should be done after the pandemic and what threats do you see in terms of more regulations or 
more state intervention in, in the economy. And we can start from uh, Adrian from The Voice from Bulgaria. Hello, uh, thank you for having me. <clears throat> thank you for this invitation. Uh, actually, I have to preface this, uh, this short statement by saying that actually it's very hard for uh, right now to actually explain, state the, what Bulgaria's policy is because we don't have a government. Uh, our ruling party for the past 10 years has finally lost an election and we are going to a second election in July. So whatever I state here might, might not actually constitute real policy in the past, uh, in, in the next, in the next year or three. Because right now we have, uh, we have a opposition in parliament, which is very new. Most of it has almost no experience and we have actually absolutely no idea as to what their intentions are uh, as far as the economy is concerned. Most of them appear to be on the populistic side, so focused primarily on, on satisfying the, the people and winning more votes. But, um, this would be the this will be for later most likely uh what i'm going to work from is uh, our plan for recovery and resilience because this is actually what our our government has stated as, as good policy for the immediate future obviously we are just following the eu's footsteps to a, to a very great extent so probably the most important thing which which sits in, in this deal is greening the economy just this transition away from coal and from uh from uh, dirty energy and we have this very major issue because we have an entire region, the region of Starazagor, which uh, deals both with mining and with energy production from coal. So uh, the big question for us in the, in the upcoming future will be how to renovate this. But as far as the market is concerned, actually, there is very little more involvement. It's all top down. It's just the government has a plan. It has a bunch of, of EU money to, to reform the region. And this is what they're going to do most likely. Uh, another big, big field in this direction is the improvement of energy efficiency of buildings. This is something which uh, the, the Borisov governments in the past have been very focused on, They're very interested in, and have spent a lot of money on. And so this is also going to be a very, very important for our, for our plan for, for resilience and recovery. Uh, there is a lot of talk about digitalization, but uh, actually very few concrete steps and measures have been taken in the, in the past few years. So I'm generally very skeptical as to, as to how far they will go digitalizing the Bulgarian economy in the next few years, especially if there is no government, no concrete plan, no direction for this matter. A very big step in our immediate future will be joining the Eurozone, because I don't know how many of you know, but uh, we formally entered the so-called waiting room for the Eurozone. Uh, in last summer, and we're supposed to join it in, in 2024. Of course, this comes with its own concerns because uh, the euro has been very expansionary in the past, um, very, very pro inflation, so to speak, and this can have both good and ne both positive and negative consequences for the Bulgarian economy in the in the coming future. Uh, this is from the side of the government. It will be just also useful to to. Not to talk a little bit about the opposition, because actually this is where the mo most of the newer ideas are going to be coming from in the, in the future. Currently, most of the opposition seems to be focused on elections, how to fix the electoral code, and some of their ideas are quite wild. We are even talking about introducing a uh, British-style majority rule in Bulgaria. And probably the only thing which uh, sits on the government side are ideas for tax reform, uh, which come from a very small party, which is uh, currently sitting on the fringe, but it contains some very pro-market pro guys, which are happy to call friends, <laughs> thankfully. And they want to, to cut a lot of red tape and lower taxes as much as possible for business. But this is um, very, very wishful thinking, saying that they will be in power in the, in the, the next in, in the next cycle. Of course, everything hangs in the balance because we have, as I already said, we have another election in, in several months. So it might be the return of the old government, which will just going to go in on its merry EU way, following this uh, trend of big government, greenification of the economy, and electronization. Or we can have these fringe new populists with some free market sprinkled in. But uh, to finish up, everything is in flux right now and speak, saying what is the official line in Bulgaria is very, very hard. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, we'll not now move closer to, to, to Poland. And uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, Martin Panek from Czech Republic, what is the state of current political discussion about uh, post-pandemic uh, recovery in Czech Republic? Uh, thank you, Marek. Uh, pleasure to be in Warsaw, at least uh, remotely. Well, I, I, I guess the situation is uh, a little similar to, to Bulgaria here because the government's majority in the in the house collapsed, and we're awaiting what is going to happen with it. 
In any case, there should be an election uh, in, in the fall, possibly in, in the summer, but I, I think we'll have to wait until, uh, uh, until the fall. What measures are being discussed? Uh, a lot of measures are being discussed. I'm not sure which ones are uh, likely to pass. So that there's this uh, per perennial suggestion that we should have some sort of Kurzarbeit, is, is the German word for a short uh, work, working time where the government would subsidize people uh, who would have shorter working, sh shorter working time but would not be fired. Of course, almost nobody was fired during the pandemic because of governmental subsidies, which on one side is uh, maybe positive, but on the other side, these people were, these workers were not available for the, for the uh, industries that were growing rapidly. Uh, there's all, uh, a lot of debate about the national recovery plan uh, that we need to submit to the EU. Uh, the regions are unhappy with the suggestions, and uh, other people are, uh, of course, happy because it, it will it will uh, um, align uh, align with their with their interests. Uh, the national recovery plans, of course, uh, in the whole of EU, have nothing to do with any post-pandemic recovery. They are just they are just uh, wishes that the that some people on the political spectrum had for years, maybe decades, and have absolutely nothing to do with any pandemic. There, there was there was a bill. Uh, recently, in the in the Czech Parliament, they, they called for uh, food self sufficiency for the for the Czech Republic, which is of course illegal under both WTO rules and under EU law, and it was defeated when the Prime Minister realized that it was actually illegal. Then he said that although this bill was uh, was sponsored by his own MPs, that he was actually against it. Then uh, in the end, he didn't even himself vote against it. He abstained, and the chairman of the of the caucus of his party voted against it. But all his other MPs were instructed to actually uh, strike it down eventually. So this bill didn't pass, but I'm sure it will resurface after the election. Uh, there is uh, currently in the in the parliament a bill on work from home legislation. Uh, although we, of course, had one year without the, this this legislation, suddenly somebody realized that this this is needed. Uh, I I don't think it's it's a good piece of legislation. Uh, I I think it will only bring um, uh, uh, chaos into into working relationships. We can. Uh, perhaps uh, discuss it further in, in the debate. And um, maybe uh, maybe controversially, there's a lot of talk about increasing taxation on various kinds of things, uh, windfall taxation for the industries that, that were doing okay in the pandemic, increased uh, taxation on real estate, and so on and so on, uh, which of course won't uh, help with the recovery at all. So very, very concisely, I think these are the main areas that are, that are being discussed in, in the Czech political sphere. Thank you, Martin. Uh, I, I already see some similarities uh, between, between uh, Czech Republic and, and Poland. And uh, I would just uh, like to ask here that speaking about the, the uh, plans that were submitted to the European Union institutions. One big topic that was discussed uh, in, in, in Poland was to put in the plan 75,000 flats for rent. And you know, in Poland, private sector builds around 200,000 flats per year. Uh, and as Martin said, you know, these plans are not about recovery. We call them shopping lists. So, you know, you have lists of various items that politicians like to build or rebuild or reconstruct but not really some concrete reforms that will uh, improve uh, climate for investments, for productivity growth. Uh, and this is our uh, big worry about the, the, the future. Uh, and uh, the last, uh, uh, Martin Blaczynski from Slovak Republic, what about situation in Slovakia? What is currently discussed in your country? Good afternoon. Uh, Marek, it seems that there are many similarities in between our countries in the Central and Eastern Europe. For example, uh, our government calls their fresh plan uh, a big bang, 
a very catchy phrase. It was introduced only uh, yesterday. Well, I said government. It's more like a uh, Ministry of Finance because our government, unlike in Czech Republic and Bulgaria, still exists. But uh, the four parties are pretty autonomous and they do not communicate with each other much. So it seems like a uh, one party show, this Big Bang. Also, their, sub, their public support is pretty low. Uh, their handling of the pandemics uh, seem to be a failure or is viewed as a failure because Slovakia uh, has one of the higher per capita death rates in the, uh, in the world, especially since November until now. The situation was really bad despite, uh, despite very long lockdowns, despite a massive uh, anti antigen testing uh, across the country, which was uh, which had to be done every few days by uh, every citizen, uh, and it uh, created a lot of tension in the uh, in the public. So this big bank is uh, not an expenditure plan; it's a complete overhaul of uh, taxes and all compulsory uh, insurance levies. The main idea is uh, to focus uh, focus the the income, the tax income from the middle and upper class onto families with children and as only families with children but not through lowering the taxation but by creation of a new huge uh, social benefits uh, so in reality uh, most of the people would have lower net wages and a whole new big network of uh, social uh, benefits for uh, people with children would be created from the new taxes there is a plan to raise VAT to 25 percent there are separate plans to rise uh, the real estate tax. There are separate plans to uh, rise the dividend tax. So it's, uh, it's a really huge thing, but uh, it's, it's very fresh and it's very, very difficult to tell if uh, it will go through because already uh, the anger in the public can be felt to some extent uh, against this plan. Another thing is, of course, the recovery plan. Uh, I would say that the Slovak government completely outsourced uh, any, any spending stimulus uh, to the European Union. We have a frame of around 6 to 7 billion through in the recovery fund to spend. So it was pretty difficult for the government to come with uh, creative ways how to spend this money. So actually everything what was on the table or what has been on the table for the past 10 years was collected and thrown inside the plan and sent to the Brussels with the hope that they will allow it to pass. So we have a building and repair of new hospitals. We have uh, large expenditures uh, on uh, all kinds of green so-called investments, but they in many cases mean just putting uh, and insulation on buildings and uh, similar spending programs. And there are many, many uh, items on this plan. But as Marek said, it's kind of a shopping list. It's not really any kind of reform plan. Although the, our politicians like to call it a, a reform plan. Uh, even the Big Bang, it's not really connected with the pandemics. Uh, also, the politicians, they often use the pandemic word as buzzword. So anything they are doing now, they say, oh, it's because of the pandemics. It's to uh, rise again from the pandemics. It's to help the recovery from the pandemics. But when you look at it uh, and try to find some logic, usually there is no, nothing. So uh, the, the biggest influence of the pandemics is probably that it opened the gates. Uh, some some actions, for example, we have a huge deficit, which will probably be close to eight to ten percent of uh, of GDP. It was unthinkable one or two years ago. Now it's considered like quite normal and expected. And even huge changes in taxes are considered not a big deal to discuss and just to implement because the pandemics it opened the gates, it made impossible things possible, and the government looks at them in this way. However, it's difficult to tell if they will be able to go through with all this. Uh, there was already a petition uh, to have a premature election, which may or may not be signed by the president, probably not, but even though there are huge tensions inside the government, and I'm not sure if it will last more than one or two years. So uh, we have a big bank on the table, but it may not really go bank. 
Th thank you, Martin. I, I see now that there might be some kind of uh, competition in the region about uh, the most catchy name for the program. You have your big bank in Poland, it's Poland's New Deal. Um, I am not sure about the names given in Czech Republic or, or Bulgaria to future plans. Uh, we heard that in Bulgaria there is election time, so maybe there is still not like concrete uh, uh, plan that uh, will be implemented. We are waiting for the election results. Uh, but I would like to hear something a bit more optimistic from you. You are all representing think tanks, expert organizations. You work a lot in the field of policy. So uh, if uh, you have power to uh, implement something, what are key recommendations, let's say three key policies that your organizations are uh, proposing or working on, uh, on, on now to uh, recommend uh, after or during post-pandemic recovery and now we can change uh, an order and we can uh, i would like to ask martin panic to start and give us your uh, your recommendations um i'll be happy to talk about a, a question though what, what happened to the keynote <laughs> if you if you hear me uh, i i also heard it so if we are ready for the keynote now we can move to the keynote and then Things are not going to get back to normal. The political and psychological changes wrought by COVID-19 will last long after the virus has faded. The world into which we emerge from the lockdowns will be poorer, colder, greyer, more pinched, more authoritarian. A collective threat of any kind, or at least a perceived collective threat, throws us back onto our most primal instincts. We become more hierarchical, less tolerant of dissent, more demanding of the smack of firm government. We've seen it the world over. People have not just acquiesced in the abandonment of their freedoms, they've demanded it. And they've become aggressive towards anyone who they perceive as an outrider. A parallel in a way can be drawn to the changes that followed the Second World War. In this, as in other countries, powers that the state had seized on a supposedly contingent basis during the mobilization were not returned when peace was restored. After 1945, Britain had emerged victorious, and yet we had identity cards until 1952, we had food rationing until 1954, we had full male conscription until 1960, and when we look at the economic controls that were supposedly put in for the war effort, we find that in fact, in many cases, they lasted until the Thatcher reforms of the 1980s. Indeed, in some cases, in elements of healthcare and education, we have them still today. We are a tribal species. We evolved in kin groups. We have a natural predilection for hierarchy, for being told what to do. Look at the uh, monarchical impulse that runs not only through our fairy stories, but even through our science fiction. I think of uh, the Star Wars franchise or any similar science fiction epics, and you'll see that it's filled with emperors and princesses and top-down hierarchical systems because somehow, on some deep genetic level, we regard that as the natural order of things. The last 200 years are a miracle in that they've elevated empirical knowledge, experience, over those natural instincts. We've learned by trial and error that elevating the individual over the collective and elevating the rules above the rulers serve to make us richer, freer and happier. But none of those lessons comes naturally. All of them have to be inculcated through a process of education and acculturation. The great writer Hannah Arendt once observed that every generation, Western civilization is invaded by barbarians. We call them children, she said. Think about that. The material with which you're made, the basic DNA that went into you is not so very different from that which would have gone in to a Homo sapiens born 10,000 years ago. Why do we live so much better? 
than we would have done 10,000 years ago, or 1,000 years ago, or 500 years ago. Not because our nature is any different, but because we have learned in important ways to adapt, if necessary, to suppress elements of that nature so as to fit it to modern society. That's the real miracle of the last 200 years that has seen, as a, at a conservative estimate, a 3,000% increase in average global living standards. We now wield powers that previous generations would have attributed to gods or wizards. Ordinary people in this country and throughout the West have a living standard that a medieval king could not have dreamed of. Why? Because we lifted the restrictions on human innovation and enterprise. We allowed people to relate one to another on the basis of free contract rather than defining their relations through birth or caste or tradition. But none of that came easily. All of it flew in the face of what we think of as common sense, what we think of as natural and intuitive. And at a time of crisis like this, we are thrown back on our most basic caveman heuristics. Keep your kids close, hunker down, avoid strangers, they probably carry pathogens. And when you turn those instincts into public policy, you end up with closed schools, closed shops, closed borders, and an altogether more protectionist world. Now here is the really dangerous and disquieting thought. Maybe the world into which we are emerging, as we haul ourselves from the chrysalis of lockdowns, maybe what people are calling the new normal was in fact normal all along. Maybe it's the last couple of centuries that were abnormal. Maybe we're coming to the end of a brief interglacial, a time when reason was elevated over dogma and when the individual was elevated above the tribe. The owl of Minerva, wrote Hegel, spreads its wings only with the gathering of the dusk. Maybe as it passes, we should take a moment to mourn the extraordinary success of the liberal world order, which, before the virus hit, was mopping up the last puddles of poverty on the planet, which was spreading education, spreading wealth, spreading longevity, literacy, and happiness to every continent and archipelago. For the first time, our species lived in an age where ordinary people could expect wealth and freedom and happiness. By heaven, we're going to miss it when it's gone. Hello again. Uh, apologies to our viewers for this minor uh, technical uh, problems, but uh, after this uh, uh, keynote and a lot of threads that were mentioned by uh, Daniel Hannan in, in this speech, I think it's uh, perfect timing to move to policy recommendations to ask our guests what uh, they think should be done to prevent Lord Hannan's vision from coming true. And uh, I would like to ask first Martin Panek about uh, free uh, policy recommendations that Liberalny Institute is now uh, working on or presenting in public discussions so that uh, post-pandemic recovery can be much better. Well, uh, we counted that the government instituted more than 50 various programs of compensations or bonuses to various sectors of the economy. And uh, it's, it's gone so far that the vice prime minister uh, is campaigning on, on the issue that it's too complicated and no, nobody understands it, uh, which is, of course, what his government uh, voted for in the parliament. So our, our recommendations are quite simple. We should lower uh, the taxes because that works for everybody, especially the VAT. The, Czech, the effective uh, VAT rate in the Czech Republic is among the third worst in the EU. So uh, obviously there is space for some, for some decreases. And if we, if we lower the uh, VAT to the levels um, 
allowed by the EU, that means 15% for the standard rate and 5% for the reduced rate, we would still not be even close to the deficit that the government proposed for last year and for this year. Yeah, even if we thought uh, that the that the VAT revenue wouldn't wouldn't increase at all from the lower taxation, it would help businesses. It would help the customers. Uh, it could maybe drive some uh, some customers from uh, the countries um, uh, um, from the neighboring countries to the Czech Republic, and it would it. It's an easy policy that would that would be uh, for the general economy, not for this sector or that sector or uh, this friend of the prime minister or this friend this friend who has the plane boarded uh, or this this other friend from his agro business and and it it it, it would be much more much more um, uh, easy to read and uh, much much more efficient we think. Uh, there are, of course, also other taxes that could be at least postponed, uh, maybe lower, maybe decreased. There was there was a decrease of the personal income tax in December at the last minute for, for this year. It was uh, it was okay. It, it decreased the personal income tax for most people, but but there are there are huge gains still to be made from lowering the uh, the. Uh, ins insurances, right? The social security tax or insurance and and and, uh, and other other uh, taxes that are that are withheld from from your income. So th there's, there's there are there are things like this that, that could be that could be done with uh, taxation, of, of course. Uh, but there's a huge opposition to that from the various lobby groups. Uh, there, there are things that could be kept, like the government scrapped, at least for the time being, the electronic evidence of revenues uh, for that there were supposed to. So everybody basically who who receives any cash in their business was supposed to um, uh, put it into this electronic system devised by the government, and, and there were waves where it was introduced first the restaurants, and then finally it was supposed to be everybody, whoever receives a, um, like a euro in cash, was supposed to was supposed to um, uh, put that into the system. It was it was scrapped for for I think two years. And we would like it to be scrapped uh, forever. It, it's uh, it costs more than it is worth. Uh, the VAT increase from 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 this system is negligible, and the uh, penalties are draconian if some people don't do it. And it, uh, it and it um, discourages a lot of businesses from from even operating. So we would like to keep that. Uh, and the, Another thing that that I personally like, but I'm I'm in a debate with other libertarians about it, is that the gover the the Prague government, the municipal government, and I think the the one in Brno as well, the second largest city, uh, they they allowed the the pubs and the restaurants to have to have the terraces or the beer gardens for free on the sidewalks, uh, and you you could immediately see last summer that that it livened the sidewalks, but there there are people that say uh, the this actually impedes the movement of the, of the of the people on the streets, and that it shouldn't be for free. But so we we disagree here. But I I, I think I think it helps the business. Then it it's I I, I like the cities better with uh, the alfresco uh, dining. Uh, so that that's that's the short statement from me. Thank you, Martin. And uh, maybe now, uh, Adrian Nikolov, what about Bulgaria? What do you think should be done in Bulgaria to make sure that post-pandemic post recovery is uh, better than what uh, might be a consequence of government programs? Well, actually, it might sound strange as a statement from an economist, but the first thing I'm going to mention is judicial, judicial reform, and particularly uh, <clears throat> altering the role of the prosecutor general in the Bulgarian judiciary, because actually this is our largest problem right now. The biggest issue that the country has faced in the past 10, maybe 15 years and has remained resolved under the current government. Uh, I just need to mention several consequences of it because uh, this, this has been more, more, uh, the largest deterrent to foreign investment in the country, the largest impediment to actual capital 
coming in uh, coming in Bulgaria. There were even cases of companies being stolen from people underneath them with the help of the prosecution. And so this is the first thing that we need we need to do. We need to ensure the independence of the judiciary from the government and from the executive wing of the judiciary. And we need to put proper checks and balance on the prosecutor general because currently he is this uh, accountable to no one figure which can who can just prosecute everybody or choose not to prosecute his friends. And so he's essentially become a tool of of governmental power which is unaccountable to no one. So this will be the first step of any government which actually wants to, wants to make good economic reform and uh, uh, invest new capital, find new people and allow people to, to just flourish in general in business. We have problems with contract enforcement as a result of this. We have very low trust in the judiciary and this will be the most important thing most likely. In the past few years we have been campaigning for tax decentralization because um, as, as uh, the previous speakers mentioned, lowering tax would of course be nice, but it seems rather impossible in Bulgaria, which has, currently has the lowest taxes in, in the European Union. So campaigning in this direction is very unlikely to, to prove any, any effective in our ways. But currently what we want to do is to empower, to, to empower local municipal authorities to have more financial, more financial responsibility, more financial resources. Because we have this, uh, this very strong mismatch where we have very strong democratic accountability in local mayors and city councils, but at the same time, uh, they are very constrained in their budgets. So what we're proposing currently is that we have um, a small portion of the, income of the income tax, currently 2% out of our flat tax of 10%, just move to the municipalities instead of the central government, so they can directly spend it as they will, according to their local problems, the local issues, and this both increase competitiveness in between the regions and attract, uh, attract capital and companies to the smaller underdeveloped regions. Probably the third thing is I'm going to mention very quickly is um, the, the very big necessity of reforms in social spending because we have a very inefficient, uh, inefficient social spending system. We just, uh, we just published a report which demonstrated that we actually have the lowest inefficiency in reducing the inequality system in the European Union again because we have these very broad programs which cover essentially most people but they don't actually don't go to the people who need, who need money the most. So we give a little, little, little bit of money to everybody but to those who actually need them very little go. So this is, this is what we want to, to improve in the past, in the next few years. Actually, this is, this is a very important direction for us because it has been receptive on some parts of the political spectrum. So what we want to do is move this very broad base to very specialized programs to actually focus to people who have specific, specific needs. And we think this would help reduce inequality. Because I know that generally liberal economists such as us are not very concerned with, with inequality, especially in incomes. But in Bulgaria, it has, becoming, it has been becoming a problem lately. Because it has been reaching levels which uh, can actually prove to be a social problem in the immediate future. So this will be for me. And of course, I'm still open for questions on these matters. Thank you, Adrian. And I can only say that I was not surprised that you mentioned uh, prosecution. I am also economist, but in context of situation in Poland, I uh, speak uh, a lot about the rule of law and current, you know, problems with independence of judiciary and problems in prosecution in Poland. And I think this is also a very important topic for economists. Uh, and I was very surprised when in our uh, recovery plans that were preliminary versions of the documents before submitting to the European Union, there was sentence put there by some government officials that there is no relation, no clear relation between quality of the justice system and uh, uh, conditions to do business and uh, uh, economic <laughs> conditions. So I, I am sure that, you know, Bulgaria is one of the proof that there is connection and you need rule of law and good enforcing powers of in prosecution independent from politicians to, for example, for foreign investments. And uh, uh, Martin, uh, what about Slovakia and your free policy recommendations for better post-pandemic recovery in the future? The past 12 months uh, were one story about huge failure of central planning. A lot, our government uh, stylizes itself into kind of a military operation. They were even using military operation terms. And uh, of course, the army was involved. And it was one failure after another, starting uh, with the preparation for the pandemics, with the protective gears, going uh, through the supplies of uh, oxygen and similar 
uh, through the management of patient flow in the hospitals up to a mass testing and of course vaccination which is considered a total disaster uh, even uh, the data handling was uh, was very bad there were huge data breaches and the good news is uh, that this was a front page failure a lot of people a lot of citizens saw in the with their own eyes that the government and the governmental institutions the the uh, emperors and the princesses are not able to handle the situation well. And at the same time, we saw many initiatives coming from the bottom, either from uh, private persons or companies. We, we saw a lot of IT people, IT companies offering and implementing open source uh, solutions to vaccination registration, to data, data mining and data analysis but also a lot of companies uh, helping with uh, creation of protective gear and sending food to hospitals and similar. And also, uh, especially the municipalities were trying hard, even with their hands tied, to make the situation better. And therefore, I'm at least slightly optimistic that the citizens and the voters saw the situation and saw how the from the bottom attitude is better than the from the top attitude. And that's our recommendation, which is quite similar to uh, the Bulgarian points two and three, which is on the first place, uh, massive decentralization of the state, rising up the municipalities, which are uh, not only the, the democracy is closer to the voter, but also uh, their managerial ability is often much better than the ability of the overall roles ruling from the westernmost part of uh, Slovakia where our capital is located, the, the whole country, and not really sink into the regions. And uh, the second, second step is uh, to outsource as many possible uh, state functions, uh, again, either to municipalities or to the private sector as possible. Because again, we saw that the private sector, even without a profit motive, even without direct uh, encouraging from the government, was able to step in and do many things. For example, testing their employers, employees, uh, trying to protect them in big factories, which is often done in much better way than in the private institutions. So decentralization and outsourcing uh, the governmental and the state functions from the top to the bottom, to the companies, to the people, to the municipalities, to the NGOs, to civic organizations. That's our main recipe for better Slovakia after the pandemics. And of course, then the usual mix of controlling the expenditures of the state, which are going out of control, controlling deficit, lowering taxes and uh, improving the rule of law. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I would like to ask you uh, about the inspirations that you can find in some COVID-19 related policies. Uh, during pandemic, I was surprised about how many things uh, can be done digitally. And before we heard that it's not possible, like the state cannot survive without uh, some things done in person. Uh, we also uh, had in Poland some progress in digitalization of, for example, healthcare services. Uh, uh, remote work was uh, uh, not regulated uh, by labor code, so it was very flexible arrangement. And I think this flexibility was uh, welcomed by many employees and employers. So uh, do you see in uh, some COVID-19 pandemic policies that were temporary, some inspirations that uh, should be kept uh, for longer or forever. Uh, I think uh, Martin Panek already mentioned one example. Uh, so maybe now we can start from Slovakia and Martin Vlaczynski. Do you see some good things that can be kept that were only temporary during uh, a pandemic in Slovakia? Of course, um, the kind of shock which uh, encompassed all the institutions and citizens forced them uh, to do some things differently. Uh, some institutions which re relied on paper were forced to try working remotely uh, using emails, using telephones. As you mentioned, healthcare, there was a big leap forward to more kind of uh, telemedicine. But on the other hand, I have to say what was achieved during the pandemics in the public or quasi-public sector 
that's something which was normal five or ten years ago in the private sector. So it's improvement only uh, if you use the public sector as your benchmark, not really uh, something spectacular happening. And uh, I'm a bit afraid that um, since this was kind of forced, it wasn't a, a decision of some policymakers to make these changes without external pressure like the pandemics. Uh, I'm afraid some of these institutions will slip back into their usual state of order and usual state of uh, doing things. What I hope is that, uh, as I said, the imprint that the municipalities can organize things, can be a good partner and that they need more autonomy and they need to transfer uh, more finance from the central government to the regions. Hopefully this will be seen and this will turn into real life policy. Thank you. I was monitoring recently the current discussion in Poland about the, the regulations of remote work. And uh, here, you know, after uh, over a year of very flexible arrangements, already we hear voices from trade unions and some other stakeholders that, you know, every piece of your day when you are working uh, at home should be some kind regulated and controlled and uh, uh, it will destroy the whole, you know, uh, benefits of flexible arrangements between employees and employers. So we hope it will be uh, blocked by, by, by our organization and some other groups that will work on this topic. Uh, what about Bulgaria? Do you see any temporary changes or policies that can be kept after the pandemic? Well, actually, there was a line of thinking, which was, uh, in my opinion, very, very good because once uh, the most most hard hit sectors of the economy were obvious it, it was hotels restaurant transportation and some other sectors which are related to them usually suppliers uh, rent a car companies and such and such and such uh, the government's one of the, the government's first reactions was actually to impose on them and just let them do whatever they can with with the with fewer burdens from the government and from the regulations so this was this was uh, some red lining i saw in the entire situation in which uh, as, we, as the other speakers already described, we saw massive government overreach in many, in many fields, of course. Another good thing which, uh, which I saw uh, uh, as, as, a positive, as a positive effect of this is the realization that pensioners in Bulgaria are actually very, very, very lowly paid and that uh, their living is impossible, especially without, without money being sent home from, from abroad, which was one of the big things which happened in Bulgaria. A lot of the money which come from, from gastarbeiters just uh, stopped, stopped coming in the country and a lot of families were left very, very poor as a result of that. So uh, this led to the realization that actually uh, there was this need of a temporary increase in pensions, but right now our parliament soon to be dissolved is uh, discussing another massive increase. And uh, even though we, should, we don't advocate for, for social programs and for increased government intervention in these fields, in the case of pensions in Bulgaria, it's very hard to uh, leave them out of poverty without actually increasing their states, their, their state provided, provided money. Aside from that, unfortunately, most of what we saw was very standard. The usual Kurzarbeit schemes, which were discussed around the world, unfortunately, we are already leaving them. Uh, some, what we saw was also a credit vacation, which is good for most of our companies because they could breathe freely a couple of, for a couple of months without the banks uh, trying to hold them back and request all, all their own without, uh, without any access to actual business. But this is mostly it. So I w what I would say is that we saw that helping business by lowering taxes and removing red tape is actually a thing that can be done even in the middle of a crisis. And I, uh, I hope that this example will be seen by more and more governments as we progress out of this crisis. Thank you, Adrian. And uh, uh, I would like to ask Martin Panek, do you uh, have some other things apart from one that you mentioned that uh, might be kept, uh, uh, was temporary during the pandemic, but might be kept for longer and worked well, and maybe it was impossible before pandemic to do things like this, but now it's uh, completely fine? So I, I think there's one thing that I haven't mentioned yet. Uh, I'm I'm not sure how this works in other countries, but here, if if you are a staff in a restaurant, you need to have a separate certificate that uh, that allows you to work with food. Uh, it, it, it's not it's not actually even expensive or that much time consuming. But if you're just looking for a short term job and you need this certificate 
for just the, for the food industry, you're probably more likely to look elsewhere. So, so this certificate, which is uh, stupid and uh, serves no purpose, was actually scrapped or it, it was suspended. It's suspended. So now for the, for the past 12 months or 13 months, you haven't needed it. And you could have worked in Subway, McDonald's, uh, wherever they, uh, the, the things that are actually still open, you could have worked without this certificate. But it's only suspended, and uh, as far as far as I can tell, no, it serves no purpose at all. Uh, I, a person without the certificate wouldn't know wouldn't know how to how to put cheese into a into a bagel, or I, I, I don't understand what the why this this actually exists. But I was actually uh, kind of pleased to see that uh, we don't have that many. It seems to me that many stupid regulations as some some of the other countries because. I think I think I I saw that in uh, the United Kingdom you have to have special licenses for uh, take home uh, orders or for de delivery orders. Whereas as, as far as I know, uh, here in the Czech Republic, if you have a restaurant, you can sell food for delivery or for take home or for whatever you want to do with it. So so actually, I was I was a little a little pleased that that we don't lead the world. Uh, the world uh, with uh, with stupid regulations. Um, other than that, like I said, we don't we don't, I, I don't at least know about positive uh, things that they were they were done away with apart from the electronic uh, evidence of, of revenues and the postponement of some of some taxes and the decrease of the personal income tax. I'm not aware of anything that would be uh, that I would be uh, that I would even reluctantly call a positive development um, what what <laughs> the vaccination is a total fiasco the the whole the whole management of covid here is a total fiasco I think I think we're uh, like the worst country actually on earth or uh, among the five worst countries so uh, we should probably look anywhere else uh, to, for guidance how to, how to do deal with it, um, even to countries where the prime minister had to be recalled because of his handling of COVID. So um, not not very many happy uh, developments here, but um, uh, let's stay positive and let's look like let's look forward. Maybe maybe there there will uh, be some shake up uh, after the the election even though i'm i'm kind of skeptical about that thank you and uh, i hope uh, we will find these inspirations uh, uh, and we are also working on on this post pandemic uh, policy recommendations we published a report in uh, february which is alternative to this poland's uh, new deal uh, i would like to uh, ask our audience to ask questions there is chat box in youtube and you can ask them uh, we still have seven minutes uh, so maybe uh, one of our speakers can can answer them but before we have uh, some other questions i would like to ask you uh, if you can mention one thing uh, apart from lockdown that was you know uh, unique to 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 yeah that was not unique that was uh, everywhere that was uh, in in all the countries that one really bad policy that is existing still it was supposed to be temporary but it should be removed uh, uh, soon do you see such a policy that you would like to 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 be removed and it was especially harmful and uh, problematic during the the lockdown maybe martin blachinski do you see such an example in slovakia well, I will not answer your question exactly, but I think it's uh, interesting to mention our testing. Uh, because at the beginning, it was quite an innovative idea to uh, start a mass scale uh, antigen testing. I think we were one of the few countries, uh, and, and definitely one of the first, which started to uh, regularly test the whole population of the country. And uh, at the beginning, it was quite an interesting idea, as the, especially as the cases were rising. On the other hand, the government uh, became kind of fixated on this texting and they really, on the first place, did not uh, learn anything from it. They did not use 
the data much, they just run the testing again, again, again. The, the whole population become really frustrated with this. And uh, only now they decided, okay, we are going to run down the testing. So kind of a good or an interesting or innovative idea turned into obsession and overshadowed uh, all other actions which uh, were about to be done and were not done. Martin Panic, do you do you see any uh, bad policy apart from you know harm done by by lockdowns? But uh, it was uh, the same in in all countries. Something bad that should be removed soon. Well, so I, I think the most obvious one is that we should still uh, rapidly increase the speed of vaccinations. Uh, I, I there's this Twitter account that um, calculates every day. Uh, the the track that we are on for 70% of vaccinated people when that would be achieved and I think today it tweeted it would be end of November which is ridiculously late so there's still there's still a, a lot of gains to, to be to be to be made here if we increase the the rate uh, massively and I think and I've thought this for for a longer time that the that the terraces of or the, the, the beer gardens of of Restaurants should be open. I don't think the benefits here of closing them down uh, outweigh the costs to the businesses, to the people. The people congregate in the parks, on the on the bike routes. Uh, the people all in the woods. The people still still are in the houses. Of course, the people still meet. So it's not it's not like it prevents people from from being together. And uh, I, I really don't see how, how the benefits outweigh the costs uh, in, in this particular measure. Um, that will be the two for me. And Adrian, do you see something like this in Bulgaria? Oh, I actually kind of find it kind of, find it kind of funny how each, uh, every, uh, each of our countries just claim that they're the worst in managing the crisis. So they have the worst track record, the worst vaccination, the worst measures and whatnot. I have to say that uh, we have very similar conversations around here in Bulgaria as well, because we are very far behind on vaccination. Our measures have been very, very slow to respond, uh, very uh, tough to, to get for business. And thankfully, actually, most of our measures are already winding down because the government was very inconsistent. They introduced measures in, in May last year, they, then they removed them. They introduced measures in October, then they removed them. They introduced new measures now in March, then, now, then they removed them in the beginning of April. And so we are mostly out of lockdowns for the time being, and most of the protection schemes, so-called, which, which the government uses to try to help business, are mostly winding down. So we are thankfully out of the big government of the situation. But what I have to mention is that a lot of terrible ideas have started to surface in the past year, and uh, they have been given public uh, public forum, which should never have happened. Uh, let me just give you one example. Uh, in the first few few weeks of lockdowns, when there was total uncertainty, nobody knew what was going to happen. Nobody knew for how long it would, it would have to be locked down. The first idea which came to the junior coalition part on them was, was to impose price ceilings on foods and medicines. And of course, you, you as economists know what effect would that, would that have, have had on the entire market. Thankfully, most of those ideas are not are not practiced. But uh, from what I see, just terrible, terrible economic ideas, uh, asking for government overreach, asking for total control of things we, which we have uh, been private for, the, for many, 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 many years now, uh, have returned to, to our country. So I'm sort of pessimistic about the past because these ideas have been spreading and they have been finding more and more support both in both in politics and in the general population. Uh, thank you. Yes, I, I, I agree with you that we we also, you know, uh, see uh, many aspects where Poland is, is the worst in terms of uh, COVID-19 policy making. My, my opinion is that probably in terms of vaccination, we are not doing very bad, like maybe much better than the New York countries, I haven't seen the most recent statistics, but uh, but it's usually Poland was in the last weeks uh, in the top of uh, vaccination rate. I received my Pfizer yesterday, so uh, uh, I am now waiting for, for the second uh, dose in, in five weeks. Uh, we had one question about uh, remote work in Poland, but uh, uh, it's kind of specific and uh, I will uh, definitely answer Marek Granowicz who asked this question as I know him in person. 
Uh, and we also have now six o'clock in, in Warsaw. I think it's seven o'clock in Bulgaria. So we will uh, come to the end of the event. So I would like to uh, say thank you to all of you for giving us uh, the local perspective of Central and Eastern Europe and uh, uh, show us the current uh, situation with and current state of policy discussion, but also giving us some policy recommendations and inspirations. So it will be useful also to me. I have a list of notes that I would might like to discuss with you after this event as well. And uh, I am sure that we can all uh, work together in on, on some of these uh, policy areas. Uh, before I uh, close this event, I would like to uh, invite all of you to follow the Free Market Roadshow social media, Austrian Economic Center, Twitter. You can find information about next events there. And the upcoming Free Market Roadshow will take place on May 10th at 1 p.m. It will be organized in Skopje and hosted by the University uh, Sans Cyril and Methodius. The keynote speech will be given by uh, Per Bilund on striving power, ripping dependence. And you can find the list of other free market roadshows uh, on the free market roadshow website. You can also watch uh, previous free market roadshows that took place in some other uh, cities in Europe uh, in, uh, in the past. Uh, thank you once again, and uh, I hope to see you soon uh, in person uh, at some other free market roadshow or other uh, freedom-oriented conferences uh, in Europe or somewhere else in the world.